Darwin's Tree of Life uh, purports to show that all living things come from one or a few common ancestors. When we look at the world of living things, we, we just automatically, intuitively group certain things together. So a robin and a finch, say, we, we recognize them as birds. We group them, in a sense, with uh, mice in the sense that they have backbones. So we have a group called the birds, I have a group called the vertebrates. Uh, we group vertebrates and animals without backbones uh, in the animal kingdom, and that is a separate group from the plant kingdom. Uh, so we do this intuitively, uh, and it produces a nested hierarchy. These things are nested within certain groups. Uh, and for centuries, people thought this was uh, evidence of God's design for creation. But for Darwin and some before him, uh, these are branches in a tree of life. So they're all connected by ancestors and descendants. They're not just uh, conceptual groups, they're actual products of this common ancestry. That's Darwin's tree of life. Uh, so that's the tree image, and that's uh, probably the most powerful and central icon of evolution. The scientific establishment typically portrays the tree of life as a fact, uh, something we can't question. All things are, all living things are related through common ancestry. But even in 2000, there were empirical problems with this claim. And now, 17 years later, the problems have grown worse. Uh, for example, in 2000, it was hoped that by comparing molecules, DNA, proteins, and so on, uh, we could construct a tree of life that would sort of zero in on the true tree. There can only be one true tree, if in fact there is one at all. Uh, and yet the more molecules that have been studied, uh, the more inconsistencies have turned up in the tree of life. So the molecules don't fit each other in many cases. They don't fit the anatomies. Uh, you get different trees depending on what you look at. Something that's happened uh, fairly recently is the discovery of what are called orphan genes. These are stretches of DNA that are found only in one group, not in any other group. Well, from the viewpoint of evolutionary theory, this isn't supposed to happen because all genes supposedly descended from genes in the past. Uh, and yet, the more we study organisms, the more we find uh, orphan genes are just everywhere. They've been found in every organism whose whole genome has been studied so far. And they don't give you a tree of life because they don't trace back to anything ancestral. Uh, so nowadays, when biologists try to construct a tree of life using molecules, they just toss out the orphan genes. They just ignore them. It's a process that's been referred to as cherry picking where you pick certain data you want to keep and you throw out the rest. And that's what's going on here. If the reason they insist on a tree of life is, uh, well, they, they assume it. It's an assumption. Uh, it happens to be an assumption that fits well with a materialistic story. Because if there are discontinuities in the tree of life, it implies that there was some kind of creative act there. So by having a continuous tree of life, you can sort of make the materialistic story sound better. If we get rid of the tree metaphor, uh, it's not sure what would take its place. I mean, some people have proposed uh, grassland, uh, a forest. Uh, it could just be a, a hodgepodge of different disconnected groups. Uh, the reason we get a tree is only because we assume at the outset that, that it's there. Mm -hmm.